Let's take our Bibles and look together again in Genesis chapter 4. In the last message, we considered Abel's offering and what it was about Abel's offering that God approved. It wasn't just a matter of Abel having had a better attitude than Cain. But as it says in Genesis chapter 4, that the Lord, last part of the verse, had respect unto Abel and to his offering. That's so vital because if we're to have any acceptance before a holy God, for God to look upon any of us if in favor, it has to be with regard to how he sees us in that offering, that sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same in verse 5, this is really what I want us to consider today, the way of Cain. What was the difference? What made the difference between Cain's offering, Cain's sacrifice, and that of Abel? Here it says in verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. There we're seeing how God views sinners apart from the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ represented in Abel's offering. That any that cling to their works or their will and offer up the works of their hands before God and hope to find acceptance, this is the warning that God cannot and will not accept any such offering because it is no satisfaction to his holiness and to his justice. And so really what we have here in the story of Abel and Cain, it's not just some cute little story that we recount to our children, but in it we see God showing sinners how it is that they must approach unto him. And as we saw last time, the fact that Abel brought an animal sacrifice. Some people argue and say, well, Abel had an advantage because he was made, as, as it says in verse 2, to be a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Well, that, that's no excuse. That having been taught, and you say, well, how were they taught? Well, Adam and Eve would have taught their children this way in which God was to be approached because they saw it with their own eyes when they fell and clothed themselves in those fig leaves which represents works of man's hands and God stripped them and clothed them with animal skins well how do you clothe somebody with animal skins unless first those animals are slain so God was the first to shed blood that that of a an innocent animal in order to clothe the guilty. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who was without sin. He was that lamb that was without spot and without blemish, but laid down his life in order that that work be imputed. It's like clothing Adam and Eve with the skin of the That was a picture of the robe of righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a physical robe that we wear, but it's the imputation of that righteousness to the spiritual account of those for whom Christ paid the debt. And so even here as Abel, if we desire to be in favor with God, it's going to be only through that sacrifice represented in the offering of Abel. And so that's the difference here. We're, we're looking at two different ways. All of religion, I don't care what, how many denominations there are in the world, but everybody falls under one of two heads, either that of Abel, which is the picture of grace, by God's grace through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the way of Cain. So I want us to see today just how evil, because men don't see it this way. They are proud of their works. And I'm sure that even Cain in coming was of such a mindset that at least these works of his hands, God would accept. 
Such was the thought of his heart. And that's the evil of this fallen flesh in which we live, to think that there is some good. Can't be all that bad, is the way that people reason. And so they continued to come before the Lord in their way, in their works. And when confronted with the truth, because that's the truth of this message here in Genesis chapter 4, that apart from that sacrifice of another, that of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is no salvation, that no work of man will ever be accepted before a holy God. And you can see in Cain's reaction here in verse 5 that we read about, it says that he was very wroth to the point where it says his countenance fell. I love the language of Scripture. It's so picturesque. You can see when people are angry, there's a change in their face. And here it's described as the countenance falling to the point of being depressed. When a person's countenance is fallen, there's depression on their face. And they say that depression is nothing more than suppressed anger. And here particularly, rather than being angry with himself, he was angry with God such a degree, and, and so this brings out the rebellion. The way of Cain reveals the way of the heart, that it is one of rebellion and anger. Rather than, than bowing to that righteousness that God himself has already approved, here it was forward-looking to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ through Abel's offering, but now that Christ has come and fulfilled God's law and justice and satisfied it to the satisfaction of God the Father that that righteousness already having been imputed or put to the account there remained nothing but righteousness for God to impute so complete is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and that on behalf of those for whom he died that's why it's evident that Christ's death wasn't for everybody otherwise everybody would be justified there'd be therefore now no condemnation but just like there's a separation here between Abel and Cain. So there's a separation of the world between those that the Lord has so taught of his grace in Christ Jesus and his death and in all others. So no matter how many denominations there are in the world, they either fall under the head of grace, represented in Abel through the Lord Jesus Christ, or that of works. But rather than be angry with himself, he was angry with God and therefore his brother. You see, this hatred of works versus grace is manifest even in how those in religion today react against. We don't find Abel here being angry with Cain. He was resting in God's blessing and grace toward him, the sinner. But it was Cain who was, because he was angry with God, and therefore anger with Christ that Abel's sacrifice represented. Therefore, he was angry with Abel. We should not be surprised when people in works religion become angry because we don't buy, we don't bend when it comes to this matter of how it is that God justifies sinners. Apart from Christ, none will be justified. Apart from his work of righteousness, there is no justification before a holy God. And so even today, the world of works religion will take it out on those that the Lord has set apart unto himself. There's nothing in the gospel that natural man delights to hear. There's an offense. Paul spoke of the offense of the cross. Well, what is the offense of the cross? Well, first of all, God has done the choosing. That offends man's sense of his own self-will, that he ought to, he wants to be the one to choose and det detests the truth that no God has done the choosing. And then to declare, secondly, the offense of the cross is the fact that Christ did not die for everybody. There's an offense even in that. People say, well, that's not fair. 
that he should have laid down his life for everybody. No, there's none that deserve to have Christ's blood shed for them. Not even ourselves, if, if we're the Lord's. We, we own that. We acknowledge that. We are the sinner. We can do nothing but beat our breast and can't even look heavenward. But as the Spirit teaches us, cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. But there's, a, there's an offense that the world, the religious world, the professing world finds against this message of grace. The fact that it's all of grace without any works of man being mixed with it. All of grace. And that grace in God electing those sinners from eternity, that grace in Christ coming and paying the sin debt of that people that the Father gave him out of all of fallen humanity, and that grace of the Spirit calling some and not others. Everything's offensive about it to natural man. But for those that the Spirit has taught, what a rejoicing. I'm thankful that no part of my salvation is in me or based upon me in any way. It's all from the grace of God in Jesus Christ, from whom all blessings flow. And so you say, well, what was wrong with Cain's sacrifice? Because over in Jude, before we get too far into this, I wanted to quote this, over in Jude, there's only one chapter, but if you look at verse 11, you can see the woes that are given here, and there's a story behind each one of these, but the common denominator is the rebellion of the heart toward God and toward the way that he has ordained that men should approach unto him. And you can see the very first person that's mentioned here in these woes, in Jude 1 and verse 11, woe unto them. He's talking, if you go back unto, up to verse 10, he's talking about those that speak evil of those things which they know not. That those left to themselves call good evil and evil good. They'll speak evil of God's choosing, and yet they'll, they'll speak good of their own choosing or their own will. Well, everything's backward, but that's uh, an evidence of the rebellion of the heart. These speak evil of those things which they know not. It's never been revealed in them. How is it that we believe God? Well, by his grace and his spirit, it pleased him to reveal Christ in us. So we speak of that which has been revealed, but they speak evil of those things which they know not. It's, that it's an evidence that if they can't give Christ all the glory, it's because he's never been revealed in them. But what they know naturally, see there's a certain natural light that men have to be able to reason and look into these things, but it's always going to be perverted. Described here as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. Brute beasts. That natural reasoning, which will always take them away from God and not to God. So very clearly, verse 11, that's a condemnation. Woe unto them. There are those that God has condemned and purpose that they'll never know his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there again, people cry, oh, that's not fair. Well, it's not based on fairness. It's based on justice, how God has determined as the supreme judge and sovereign of the world to save whom he will and condemn whom he will. But the warning here, you can see, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So that's what we're looking at. What is the way of Cain? That many still follow today and ran greedily after the error of Balaam. As I said, there's a story behind each one of these mentioned. For reward, people do what they do for reward, like Balaam. Cain did what he did out of pride and perished in the gainsaying of Cory, the sons of Korah that questioned Moses' authority to be that mediator that God had established. In every one of these things, as I said, the common denominator is rebellion, but it's rebellion because of a darkened heart. And uh, unless God, by his grace, is pleased to convert the heart to Christ, that's how men will live and die, following this way of Cain. So, what 
was wrong with Cain's sacrifice. It wasn't just a matter of attitude, but it was the wrong sacrifice. And number one, it's because it was a bloodless sacrifice. As I heard a preacher say one time, you can't get blood out of a turnip. That the Lord Jesus Christ, God purposed that his person and work be depicted in the Old Testament right from the beginning there in the garden all the way until Christ came be depicted by a sacrificial lamb. But somebody that comes with a bloodless sacrifice, in other words, the works of their own hands as Cain did, what they're really saying, they're denying their need of Christ. That's why the Pharisees, even with all the scriptures that they had, pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ who should come, they turned thumbs down on him and rejected him, rebelled him against him because they did not see themselves in need of a redeemer. They were looking for a political deliverer like so many today are wanting political deliverance so that people can get on with their lives and so they're raising up their voices and crying out to a, a God that they know not asking for deliverance from their woes and from their physical ailments or from death or other things. They're thinking in terms of natural physical deliverance, but not the Lord Jesus Christ. Many today are taking advantage of people whenever there's a disaster or there's something that the Lord sends that causes fear, that they're invited and invite him into their hearts and lives in order that they could be saved. That's the word that's used. But that's not where salvation is. Salvation is in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ already accomplished there at the cross by his life and death for those that the Father sent him to save. That's where salvation is. It's in the person and work of Christ, not in the decision of man. But you can see then how people think that if they just walk an aisle or say a prayer or decide for their Jesus that somehow they'll be saved and God will honor them. That, that's the same thought that Cain had coming with the works of his own hands. That's the way of Cain. Cain would be his own priest and his own mediator and his own intercessor rather than bow to the clear revelation of God that it would be through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, alone. And so that's why he was wroth, because this self-will will not bow unless the Lord breaks it. And we would be still ourselves in this way of Cain were it not for God mercifully and graciously turning this heart. But that's the number one problem with Cain's sacrifice. It wasn't attitude, although we know that his attitude was wrong. It was the wrong sacrifice. And secondly, then, by bringing what he did, Cain, in essence, was denying that he was a sinner before God. In fact, that was part of his jealousy. How it was that God would accept Abel and his sacrifice, but not accept Cain and his sacrifice? Abel offered what he did, having been taught of the Spirit, that he was indeed that sinner that needed the work of God on his behalf through that Redeemer, that Savior, who would come and shed his blood. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you want to turn over there, you can see what was the object of Abel's faith. It certainly wasn't faith in his faith, and it had nothing to do with his own persuasion or decision, but rather that faith that was given to him was to look forward to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what makes the difference. You want to know whether it's the faith of God versus a mere profession. Look at where the eyes of that sinner are turned. If it's to works, if it's to some sort of good in themselves, that's not faith. It's a false faith. But if it's to Christ and Christ alone and his finished work at Calvary, then that's the faith of God. 
even as it says here in Hebrews 11 and verse 4, by faith, so having been given eyes to look to Christ, wherever you see that word faith, you can substitute it with the word Christ. By Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. That tells you right there, it wasn't that God was showing favoritism. People argue that way. They say, well, if he's gracious to this one, not that one, then God's showing favor. No, he's showing grace. But it's not because there was any good in Abel. But the difference here, it says, Abel offered, because of Christ, looking to Christ, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. In other words, God looking upon Abel through this sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ would come and accomplish on his behalf, it says there, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He was one of those to whom God would impute that righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was righteous in how he approached unto God in this one way. And God testifying of his gifts, that's not the gifts of like talent it's speaking of there, but it shows us that this wasn't just a one-time thing. The word gifts there speaks of the sacrifices that throughout his lifetime, Abel continued to offer as gifts unto the Lord. His salvation is a gift of the Lord. And so this, these sacrifices, the bloody sacrifices that he continued to offer, he continued to do so. God testified of his gifts. In other words, until Christ would come, this was the way God determined that, that those who were his should approach unto him through those animal sacrifices. But we know that it was temporary. God was forbearing in overlooking, passing over the sins of those that were his in the Old Testament until Christ should come and put away their sin. That's why David declared, blessed is the man there in Psalm 32, to whom God is put in a double negative, will never, no, never impute sin. Why? Because he purposed that it be imputed to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was on that faith, by that revealed faith, that Abel continued to approach unto God. And you can see there in the last part, and by it, in other words, by this testimony, by the way that God taught him to continue to approach, he being dead yet speaketh. It means that we must learn from what is revealed concerning Abel to know how it is even today that uh, God will receive sinners. It's only going to be based upon and through the merits and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the way of Cain that we're seeing here is because Cain did not see himself as a sinner before God. That's why he came the way he did. And until God was pleased to teach us and show us that we were lost, this is how we came. Because we did not see ourselves as sinners. We saw ourselves perhaps as having this sin or that sin, and oh, I need my spiritual soap to kind of clean up and move forward. But if God has ever shown you that you are lost, then you will never ever again look back to any kind of works of your own for being able to approach unto God. Because you now know not just that I am a sinner and, and this sin and that, but you know the sinfulness of your sin. The Lord has made you to see just how wretched your heart is. And therefore you can never, ever approach unto him in any way other than through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Cain, just by his anger, thought that, that he deserved better. That's the way people react today when you speak to them about God being just and holy and casting sinners into hell. And their reaction, they pull back and they, oh, no, no, there's none that deserves that. Well, they don't know themselves. I think about this all the time, that if God spared not his only son, but delivered him up, 
in order to save that people that he had given him, then don't think for even a nanosecond that God will not cast into utter darkness and condemnation those that were left to themselves and that God did not save by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell itself, that's why it's eternal. Eternal sufferings of sinners can never satisfy a holy God. People pretend to think that eventually God's going to have pity and he's going to bring them out and then everybody will be saved in the end. No. The, the distinction in how God saves sinners is clear and is forever. That without the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, those that suffer eternal separation from God do so justly. But the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, that word gnashing of teeth is anger. There's not going to be any repentance in hell, but only anger. There's not even remorse. That the same anger that's in the heart of sinners like Cain, that's the way of Cain, that when they die, that continues on forever. It'll never change. And so God is just in his condemnation. But here again, we see that it was the wrong sacrifice, but also it was... Cain's rebellion, denying that he was such a sinner before God, that he didn't deserve God's rejection based upon him and his sacrifice. That's why he continued to approach God on the, the grounds of his own merits and his own works. And he was proud of the fruit of his fields, proud of what he brought, and yet he was rejected. That's why his anger is revealed there in verse 6. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? There in Genesis 4. Now here's the part that we see, too, where people say, Well, I think God ought to leave the choice up to man. Well, here's an example. What does he say to Cain here in verse 7? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Here again is one of those portions of scripture that men look at with natural eyes and uh, they come away with the conclusion, you see, God is waiting on him to make a decision. That's the way they interpret it. But that's not the sense of the word do us well. Here, to do well would be for Cain to go get that animal sacrifice. Just like Abel took that sheep and offered it unto the Lord one without blemish, that Cain should go and do the same. That's what it is to do well, to approach unto God with that one sacrifice, through that one sacrifice that he has ordained. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. What that's saying is that apart from the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that blood sacrifice represented, there is no other sacrifice. There is no other acceptance before God. And that no sin could be pardoned apart from that one sacrifice. And he says there, unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, man's desire is always going to be that God should accept some part of his works before him. But when it says thou shalt rule over him, that means that that's that determination that only the Spirit of God gives never to approach in any other way than through the blood sacrifice. And again, left to himself, Cain never did come as God ordained. He only became angry. And over in Hebrews chapter 10, if you look there with me, Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 25 to 29. You could go all the way to the top in verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, but note, by the blood of Jesus. How is it that any of us, like Abel, can hope to have acceptance with God except to be by the blood of Jesus, which is what the sacrifice of Abel represented. 
And now by a new and living way. See, those in the Old Testament, that was by type, picture, prophecy, and promise. The offering of those animal sacrifices. But now, that new and living way is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he fulfilled all of those types. Which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That veil that was in the temple. In the tabernacle that only the high priest could enter in once a year, and that not without blood. Now Christ has entered in through the veil, and notice, that is to say his flesh. That's why on the cross that veil was rent in twain from top to bottom. It's a representation of Christ shedding his blood, having come in the flesh for the purpose of laying down his life. And now that veil no longer was necessary because Christ himself had entered in through the veil, through his flesh, and having an high priest. So he was not only the sacrifice, verse 21, but he's the high priest. Over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance. There's no reason to have any kind of assurance if, if we're not coming in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us draw near with a true heart. This is the work of the Spirit of God in the heart with in full assurance of faith. That's not putting the emphasis on my believing, but of him who is the object of faith. There again, wherever you see that word faith, put Christ. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of Christ, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. An evil conscience that would, just like the Lord was saying here to Cain, to, to rule over that thought that somehow he was going to continue in that false way, our bodies washed with pure water. The washings of priests by that water before they entered in. Well, our bodies have been washed with pure water. Christ being that pure water, the water of life. He is our justification. He's our sanctification before a holy God and what he accomplished. So verse 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, that word profession is the word confession. Let us hold fast to that confession of that faith that God has given. And there again, you can replace the word faith with Christ. Let us hold fast the profession of Christ, the confession of him that through his blood and righteousness alone we're justified. Without wavering, not hesitating, because we know ourselves to be sinners as taught by the Spirit of God. Notice, for he is faithful that promised. There's no faithfulness in here. But he is faithful. His promise is that he has promised to save sinners in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ and his satisfactory death, shedding his blood, that God might be just to just. That's where it is. And so verse 24 says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. It's not saying, okay, the salvation is by Christ, but now we add our works. No. This word, good works, here would be the same as what the Lord told Cain. If thou doest well, thou shalt, shalt thou not be accepted. How do we provoke one another unto love and to good work? Good is God's work. Provoke one another unto love. In other words, as we speak together with one another, let it be out of that love of God that eternal love whereby he has loved us in Christ and thereby we love one another, those that are his. And speak of God's works. You see good works, it's a derivative of the word God. To speak with one another of God's works in every way, in his electing grace and the redeeming grace and the sanctifying grace that all the glory belong unto God. Now, when it says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, that portion of Scripture has been so used and abused that people use it to try to force you to make sure you're in a, what they call church, at all times, every time the door is open, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. But in the context here, it's speaking even as a word of warning concerning the way of Cain that somehow you're assembling together at some point now, you tire 
of coming together to hear of Christ and him crucified, and you go your own way thinking there's some better way than this. And so we know of many this way. They come sit and listen for a while, but because their heart has not been taught of Christ, pretty soon they tire of hearing of him. Tire of hearing of his work accomplished for sinners such as we are, and they go their own way. They separate themselves out, as it says here, as the matter of some is. But that, again, connected with verse 24, constantly let us consider one another to provoke unto love, that love of God in Christ and to God's works, his grace and his providence that has led us to Christ and keep us there. But here, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching, exhorting one another how? To continue to look to Christ. As we meet for worship, that's all that that is about. It's not about us or who's there and who isn't, but that those that the Lord has brought together that our fellowship be in him by his grace, looking to his sacrifice alone accomplished for sinners such as we are. It says here in verse 26, and this is another scripture that is greatly abused. It says, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. A lot of people read that and say, ah, see, you can sin away God's grace. That's not what it's saying here. What it's saying is that those that might be among us, like goats with the sheep, that determining, like the way of Cain, determining that it's their way or no way, even to their own detriment and to their own condemnation, that if they should separate themselves out, wherever they go, just know that there is no other sacrifice to which they can turn. There remaineth no more sacrifice. There's nothing else that they can find by separating themselves out that's going to satisfy holy God other than the sacrifice of Christ. So here again is the way of Cain left to his own depraved heart and mind thinking that somehow he could still be okay. But there was no other way. And that's why, again, there in Genesis 4, the Lord said to Cain, if thou doest not well, if you go in this way and continue in this way, Cain, sin lies at the door. That's because there is no other way of sin being put away other than in by and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the warning here that any that separate themselves out and go another way thinking that somehow they're going to find satisfaction in some other sacrifice, that of the works of their hands, that there remains no more sacrifice. There's none of it that God has ordained other than the sacrifice of his son. But a certain, verse 27, fearful, looking for of judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And so it is with any that despise, as it says there in verse 20, he that despised Moses' law, under the law, died without mercy, under two or three witnesses, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? Notice, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. That's how Cain was looking at that sacrifice of Abel as an unholy thing, that somehow the fruit of his hands was better than anything that sacrifice could offer, and thereby has done despite under the spirit of grace. I'll tell you, there's no greater condemnation than to be left to ourselves or to seek to continue to approach in the way of Cain, a way that can never find acceptance with God. And so, coming back here to my text, we can see this consequence of Cain's rebellion and hatred because it was toward God, it was toward Christ, so it was toward Abel as the object of God's grace. Verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. That's what the Lord was 
saying to Saul of Tarsus when he stopped him on the road to Damascus, when he was going to arrest more people that confessed the name of Christ, and the Lord stopped him. And uh, when uh, he cried out, who are you, Lord? So he didn't know God. He didn't know Christ to that point. That our Lord answered. He spoke to him from glory and uh, told him that he was Jesus, that Saul was persecuting. You say, how was he persecuting? Well, he agreed to his death. He was one of the principal Pharisees that condemned Christ to death, but he was persecuting Christ and persecuting his people, going after his people, because those that are members of Christ's spiritual body are, are Christ's. They're one with him. And so even here, Cain killing Abel really was a way of getting his hands in anger on God and on the Lord Jesus Christ, but he couldn't reach him, so he killed his brother. And that's when the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? It doesn't mean that Christ, the Lord didn't know, but again, the question is asked to bring it out of Cain. And you can see Cain's response and indifference, just like he was indifferent toward the, the glory of God and the sacrifice that God required. So he's indifferent toward his brother, having killed him, you can imagine. Such was the hardness of the heart. He said, I know not. See, a liar is a liar from the beginning. Christ told the Pharisees, you are your father, the devil, who is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? It's that same indifference that people have today, unaware of the, the condemnation of their own souls, but even in, in how they view those that are the Lord's, their anger toward the Lord's people means nothing to them. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed, from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. What a, what a condemnation that even though he was still alive, yet this curse would follow him all the way to his death. There are a lot of people that think because they're still alive, they're not under God's condemnation. But if God leaves men to their own Prayed heart to where they live their lives and labor. That's what he's speaking of here, that he would labor, but he would do so as a fugitive and a vagabond, wandering from one place to another. And uh, yet without Christ, of what satisfaction is any of that? That they continue to strive to make something of their life, even though they're condemned and never give up the works of their hands. Many are like that in religion today. They continue to attend these places of worship, but will never give up the works of their hands left to themselves. Oh, how we need the grace of God. Cain, again, given that choice, people say, well, I think God should have given Cain the choice. Well, you saw what happened when he left him to himself. He never did come to God. The only way that any sinner ever comes to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, based upon Christ's merit in Christ's work is by his grace and by his spirit. Otherwise, we'd be all as dead men walking. You've heard that expression. That's what Cain was, a dead man walking. Oh, that God would so teach our own hearts, cause us to see that apart from the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. But oh, the joy having the Spirit to reveal Christ in the hearts of such sinners as we are. We don't deserve it. But by God's grace, if he is so purposed, then all the glory belongs unto him. And I pray the Lord will so bless to the glory and honor of Christ, his word that we've heard today. Amen.